Good evening to you all, and thank you for joining us for what is now, is today, the seventh installment of the Borton Mosley Distinguished Lecture Series on Eurasia. Now, this program is jointly sponsored by the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the Harriman Institute, both at Columbia University. I'm Myron Cohen, and I am the Weatherhead East Asian Institute's director. Since its establishment in 1949 as the East Asian Institute, it has worked to expand research on East Asia and to train new generations of scholars in the humanities, social sciences, and the professions. Founded in 1946 as the Russian Institute, the Harriman Institute is a leading center for the advancement of knowledge in Russian, Eurasian, and Central Asian <coughs> studies. Commemorated by this lecture series are Hugh Borton and Philip Mosley. They were members of the founding generation of the Russian and East Asian Institutes at uh, Columbia University, and so their achievements live on. As far as this series is concerned, previous speakers have included Christopher Hill, who was then Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Stephen Kotkin, Professor of International Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School for Policy at Princeton University, and Morton Halperin, Senior Advisor for the Open Society Institute. This evening, we are most delighted to have as our distinguished lecturer, Professor Gilbert Ro Rosman, the Musgrave Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. Gilbert Rosman had taught at Princeton University's Sociology Department since 1970 and was named Musgrave Professor in 1992. The Northeast Asian societies of China, Japan, Korea, and Russia are his research focus. And, his research, and for his research, he uses sources in the languages of all four countries. He has compared these societies with respect to issues of sociological concern, such as population, urbanization, or modernization, and more recently, national identities, a subject he will be dealing with this evening. In addition, he works on sociological factors in international relations, emphasizing mutual perceptions and barriers to regionalism. By my count, which I know is an undercount, he is the author of at least 13 books and editor or co-editor of 10 more, but add a few to each of those categories, please. Among his uh, recent books are Chinese Strategic Thought Toward Asia, U.S. Leadership History and Bilateral Relations in Northeast Asia, East Asian National Identities, Commonalities and Differences, and Strategic Thinking About the Korean Nuclear Crisis, rather timely, Four Parties Caught Between North Korea and the United States. So Professor Rosman speaks to us this evening on a reassessment of Sino-Russian relations, how national identities trump national interests. <coughs> Following his presentation, Weatherhead East Asian Institute faculty member, Professor Charles Armstrong, will offer remarks before, before we start the audience question, uh, question and answer session. Charles is the Korea Foundation Professor of Korean Studies in the Social Sciences in the Department of History, and he's also director of the Center for Korean Research. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Tyranny of the Weak, North Korea and the World. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the podium over to our Borton Mosley Distinguished Lecturer. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gilbert Rosman. It is a genuine honor to be part of this distinguished series and to return to Columbia where I have had some very pleasant academic experiences over the years. Uh, recently in this in the last eight or so years I was involved with um, Charles and Sam Kim in a project putting Korea at the center. I came here with Tom Bernstein and, uh, to contribute to a book on uh, reassessing Sino-Soviet relations, and I participated in, in a project by Bob Legvold on uh, looking at Russian international relations and historical perspective. These were all Columbia activities that I found very, uh, very productive. Um, today's topic, uh, returns me to a subject that really was the beginning of my academic research interest. 
Fifty years ago this month, I submitted a junior paper. I was in the critical languages program at Princeton for a junior year, and I was studying Chinese and Russian, and my junior paper was assessing Sino-Soviet relations. Uh, I must acknowledge that uh, what I tried to understand was still very rudimentary, but that was really where I began my academic work. Uh, when I shifted somewhat from comparative studies to what I always knew was my objective, international relations, uh, it, hap it began with a project in the Soviet Union. I was asked to go there as part of a binational commission to assess 35 years ago um, Soviet studies of China, and I began to learn who was writing under which pseudonym, what were the debates like in, at that time, trying to get be behind the veil of secrecy about that. And five years later, I was in China to do the parallel project on the Chinese debates about Soviet socialism, just as I think uh, before Gorbachev, we saw some real possibilities for a breakthrough in relations between Moscow and Beijing that weren't well realized despite normalization that took place in 1989. And then when I turned 20 years ago to the post-Cold War order and started looking for what is the reorganization of Asia going to be like? And that was a, an interest that turned brought me all around the Korean Peninsula. And then I suddenly realized I'd better learn something more about Korea in order to see uh, what th that factor was in the transformation. But uh, that took me to, uh, to China for quite a bit, and I became fascinated by Sino-Russian relations. Um, and Finally, about a decade ago, I began teaching a course on national identities and great powers, comparing Chinese, Russian, Japanese, U.S. national identities. And while I saved for the end my effort to really understand how Russian and Chinese national identities compare with each other, how they've evolved and how they influence international relations, that was really a big part of my objective. And so after I, I worked on some other elements comparing, for instance, East Asian national identities in China, Japan, and Korea, and looking how national identities influence bilateral relations among those countries and including the United States as an object of those countries, I finally made the shift to Sino-Russian relations. So you're really the first group that will be hearing the conclusions that I've been drawing about this relationship. I think it's particularly significant. I think we've always underestimated the significance and the research opportunities for looking at this relationship. During the Sino-Soviet split, just as I was beginning my academic career, or studies really, um, we got into the Vietnam War, I think in large part because we misunderstood Sino-Soviet relations. Uh, when you try to understand what happened in that war and why we proceeded the way we do, so much of it, uh, and I was among the students paying attention to it and even demonstrating against it, so much of it was about uh, what the U.S., how the U.S. interpreted Sino-Soviet relations. I think it was very significant again in the 1980s when uh, we tried to understand why did the Cold War end? What were, what, who was who gets the credit or the responsibility? What is the nature of the transformation? And we really didn't understand what the Sino-Soviet component of that was and how it would be likely reinterpreted. And then we go to the 1990s and there was a lot of sort of dismissing of the, uh, the new cooperative or strategic partnership between the two countries. I think that continues today talk about an alliance of convenience as if there's really no, no depth to this relationship and it may be not last very long. Or talk about some analysis of the recent summit uh, 
when Xi Jinping went to Moscow. I think it was uh, rather superficial. And so I want to take a, a different perspective, and partly this is a perspective based on uh, a framework that I've been developing for studying national identities and their impact on, on relations. Uh, so if you ask me, did we, did national identities matter in the history of Sino Russian relations, Sino-Soviet relations? They mattered enormously. No one could explain what went wrong in that relationship based on national interest why they turned against each other with such rabid uh, hostility for more than two decades. No one would, I think, can make sense of the delay in normalization in the 1980s, which led to, uh, in some ways, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the, the sense that the Soviet Union failed in its foreign policy that both of these countries share in recent thinking without understanding their identity problems in the past. And I think no one would really make sense of the relationship today strictly in terms of national interest. So let me go into some explanation as to why I think this is not just a pragmatic relation, as many, many people suggested. Deng Xiaoping, the supreme pragmatist, who talked about crossing the stream by you know, feeling your way from rock to rock. Not a, simply a realist approach. Many suggested that Putin was a, real, a realist, and that was his approach to foreign policy. Uh, not the end of ideology, as some were suggesting in the early 90s, ripe for a global community, but rather, I will argue, there is something called a communist great power national identity syndrome shared by China and uh, Russia, which is the legacy of the long period when these two countries reshape their identities under the influence of communism. Uh, many people sort of assume that when you start talking about communism, you're talking about ideology. And when you talk about identity, you're talking about something deep-seated that precedes communism and sort of revives after communism, uh, moves away from its traditional phase. And I don't uh, share that. I think communism is a very powerful force for reshaping identity, for integrating in some ways, even to the, as it rejects many aspects of traditional identity, integrating elements of the old identity with the new. Uh, so I think one could go into some detail why communism ought to be seen as leaving a powerful um, after effect on the look, outlook on the world. But let me be more specific about national identity because it's a term used widely, often imprecisely in many ways. So I, just to give you a quick definition, although I, the, the, my breakdown into dimensions is far more important than any definition, I would say it's what a country regards as distinctive about its past, present, and future why it claims it's distinctive versus other countries. And almost always that means not just distinctive, but superior. What makes it um, something different and, and better? So I think Stalinism and Maoism were both efforts to inculcate a, an identity in their people. And that was quite different from what traditional Marxism, uh, even to a great degree, Leninism had suggested would be the identity that would come with the advance with the communist revolution. Um, I think when the Sino-Soviet split occurred, it was primarily about identity. And ideology, that dimension of identity, was so dominant that it, um, it eclipsed the possibility of seeing their relationship in, in other ways. Um, 
So um, the second concept I would introduce after national identity is a national identity gap. And that's where two countries, which re at least one of which regards the other as highly significant for its identity, um, to the extent, to what extent do they, does their difference in identity, their perception of each other's identity, shape their relationship with each other? So one can estimate the scale of the national identity gap, and I do so by breaking it down into five dimensions, even suggesting we can estimate the, uh, the, the strength of each dimension from zero to five, arguing that if we have all five dimensions at maximum intensity, we've got a national identity gap of 25, uh, and suggesting you can then compare the nature of the gap, the scale of the gap at different points of time with different countries. Uh, and I've tried to do that in my recent work emphasizing China's identity gaps and how they've changed with Japan, South Korea, and the United States. Uh, but here we'll talk about the identity gap between China and Russia. So I'll turn next to the dimensions of national identity and, and indicate um, how I've been looking at this, um, and maybe afterwards uh, say a little bit about uh, the transformation of the identity gap between these two countries uh, over the last uh, two decades or longer, and then re reflect on the recent summit uh, and what that tells us about the Sino-Russian relationship and the co broader context of this relationship within a rapidly changing uh, architecture of um, Asia, both East Asia and Eurasia. So the first dimension is ideology. And I wouldn't be blinded by what traditional communism called ideology. I think you can still have ideology. And I would argue that both China and Russia have re, re constructed their ideologies, and I see three primary parts to that idea, to that reconstruction. The first is, um, in China, socialism. And some say, ah, oh, socialism doesn't have much meaning in China. Well, you're not reading much that's coming out of China. It's all over the place. It's powerful. It's re-emphasized. Re Socialism is big in Chinese academic publications. It's big in the speeches of the leaders. It's become bigger than it was before. Uh, don't underestimate the role of socialism as part of an ideological amalgam. Now, Russia, it's not socialism, but it's sort of accepting the legacy of socialism as something that has to be recognized positively. So it's, it's a weaker force than in China. The second element of ideology is anti-imperialism. Huge factor. Whether you call it imperialism or hegemonism or some other theme, it, is, uh, it provides a powerful continuity with the, um, with the criticisms of the United States and the West that were prevalent in the Cold War era. And the third factor is Sinocentrism or Russell-centrism, which rises to the level, in my mind, of ideology because it's really virtually unchallenged. You find virtually nothing written in either country that questions the importance, the essential role of this. And so um, they, they have revived their notion that they are central countries in some regional or global context. And so combining the three, I argue that they have a pretty powerful national identity impetus and that it has intensified. It's intensified in China, particularly after the Beijing Olympics. I think that was somewhat of a turning point for re-emphasizing identity themes, um, although you could see it 
gaining strength at various points in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, it's intensified in Russia under Putin and again considerably after Putin announced his plans to run for re-election and he's pressed these themes. So the anti-imperialist element has strengthened, the socialist element, the Sinocentric element, the Russell-centric element, there's a lot happening to strengthen this. Now if you say, what does, how does ideologic ideology affect their relationship with each other and their uh, relationship with the significant other, the United States? And the answer is, they both claim that they're not guided by ideology, but they say ideology is very important because the United States is obsessed with ideology. So the ideology is transferred to the U.S. and the U.S. is pressing an anti-communist Cold War mentality that is um, uh, ex explained in very similar terms on the Chinese and Russian sides. Now there's somewhat more static on the Russian side. You can find people who have very different points of view, but I don't think they're very significant in shaping leadership um, thinking. And on the Chinese side, there are some courageous, maybe foolhardy academics on dealing with recent issues such as North Korea uh, who say things that don't, aren't consistent with the ideology, but I don't think they have any significance for policy debates, and I don't share the argument that China is going through a serious policy debate about North Korea right now, uh, given what I've heard from uh, sources there and what I were read in uh, Chinese publications. Um, but at any rate, that is the ideological dimension. The second dimension is what I call temporal or the history factor. And here too I divide it into three, and I argue that there's a First, you can deal with the periods before um, communism. Then you can deal with the periods um, uh, of the, particularly the Cold War, but uh, communist period, and finally the post-Cold War. And then you can ask, well, what is, how has the identity gap been changed between China and Russia, uh, and how does that compare with their gaps with others? Well. Pre-modern history, you know, during the Sino-Soviet split, they each saw the other side's pre-modern history as deformed in some way. Something really had disturbed the history, created, created a, uh, you know, a, 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 this traditional Marxist notion of stages of history and you go through feudalism and capitalism and socialism and so on. There was this predictable sequence and something really early in history had caused China and Russia to go way off course. That's what they were writing about each other. Um, I first wrote about this in a 1974 article in the Journal of Asian Studies, the Soviet view of Maoism, the origins of Maoism, how it came in each from each period of history. Uh, well, forget it. Their histories are no longer seen as irregular or important. The history that matters is the West and what the West was doing to each of their countries and the world order from early in history. And in Chinese sources, you, there's a lot written about uh, the West, West was full of wars. China was a harmoni has a harmonious tradition, emphasizing peace, getting along well with its neighbors. The West was always full of uh, wars and messianic uh, efforts to, to convert others and, and ex 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 sort of imperialism from the earliest point in history and on and on. And Russia's obsessed with negative things about the West in history, even though Russia at times has associated itself as part of the West, but I don't think that is uh, a major theme in national identity discourse of the mainstream in Russia anymore. Uh, and so uh, you get the sense then that pre-modern history no longer has much to say about the differences between these two countries, has a lot to say of differences with the West and with some other countries who, which are neighbors, which are vilified, 
Japan and South Korea have seen their pre-modern histories reinterpreted in China in recent years in very negative ways. So it isn't just Japan, the imperialist country that in the late 19th and century and first half of the 20th century was so bad. It is a country that had a deformed history long back that created the potential for it to go way off course. And so the, the demonization of Japan is the most intense in China in recent times, but it's also Korea. I mean, Korean history is looked at very negatively. I wrote a piece that came out this summer, this past summer, in Asian Perspective on the Chinese analysis of Korean history, period by period. And there's been a real shift in, in that regard. Okay, then you go to the second period of history, essentially the Cold War. And I think, I don't have to say a lot about this, except to say China and Russia now have found a consensus that the Korean War was a just response to U.S. imperialism. So if you try to look at the major textbooks coming from these countries, the major discussions, and of course Xi Jinping in late 2010 uh, at the, um, the 60th anniversary of the outset of the war proclaimed this a glorious war and spoke very positively about the Chinese-North Korean relationship. No criticism of North Korea's involvement uh, or how the war started, so on. The discussions about the war's beginning and the more ambivalent statements about the Korean War of the 1990s have essentially faded away. Um, and so you get um, the Cold War, the Sino-Soviet split. You won't find much about that in Chinese or Russian writings. It was a big theme in the 70s and 80s in both of their writings, criticizing each other. It's faded. It's not a big deal. The Cold, the Cold War was the United States versus communism, and that has come roaring back as the big historical theme. Now, the post-Cold War. The U.S. perspective on this long was, and we assume that uh, Russians and Chinese agreed with this for a time, was that the post-Cold War was building towards a, a global community and we were all were cooperating together to try to resolve major problems of the world and um, this was a, a positive time for working together. The more recent treatment, I can assure you from my readings, is the U.S. continues to insist on a kind of Cold War mentality and is trying to contain China and weaken Russia, doesn't want these countries to resume their, or assume a, a proper place in the world, and we're still dealing with essentially the continuation of the, of the Cold War. The turning point wasn't 1989. The turning point some in China had suggested was coming in 2000 and nine or 10 after the global financial crisis. I think basically, it, seen as having, having have not, has not come yet, still has to occur. So this is the temporal dimension, where they now are partners in trying to create a just world in a post-Cold War environment where the United States is not contributing positively and it's has swayed some other countries in Europe and Japan and Korea uh, under similar types of thinking. And um, this is the national identity dimension on, uh, from uh, dealing with history. The third of the five dimensions I'll, I'll highlight is that of what I call the sectoral dimension. It has three parts again. The first part is political national identity, the second is economic national identity, and the third is cultural national identity. And all three can be examined, again, through the writings, uh, the mainstream writings uh, of uh, Chinese uh, and, and, and Russians, uh, and I find very little contradiction to these writings, although I think many good academics sort of stay away from these identity themes and try to work on other, other kinds of issues. But when you ask, who's actually writing about cultural identity or the cultural differences between countries, it tends to be people who are more um, in tune with the overall identity argument. Uh, whether coming out of the mainstream newspapers and journals, of course, Global Times has a great deal of this in China, or in the academic publications. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences shifted 
uh, substantially towards a national identity narrative uh, some years ago, away from the uh, more, uh, I would say, balanced academic approach uh, of the uh, 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so on this dimension, political national identity is struggling against um, the U.S. Um, approach to democracy, interference, and internal affairs of other countries. Each of them regards their own political identity uh, more positively. The, China, the Russian notion of sovereign democracy from a few years back, the Chinese notion of, of defending the state's role, emphasizing the state. Um, and then you get the, uh, the uh, economic national identity, China taking advantage of the financial crisis to make the arguments that we saw in the Soviet Union in the 1960s and 70s, and we saw in Japan in the 70s and 80s, that they had a superior economic model grounded in a superior social model uh, that made them uh, versus the United States and the West, which were uh, going to grow slowly or have a crisis of capitalism and that sort of thing. So the economic argument has been very strong in uh, raising the, the confidence uh, about um, national identity. And then you get the cultural argument. And here, I pay a lot of attention to this. Arguments about civilizational differences. And while I was not um, so impressed with Huntington's argument uh, nearly 20 years ago about the clash of civilizations, because I think empirically it wasn't well done, uh, but, did, but even at that time, I appreciated the notion that culture is a very important variable in thinking about how countries uh, face each other. And really, I think that both China and Russia regard the civilizational threat as particularly acute, much greater than the, um, than the military threat. I mean, from a military point of view, they want to build up their military to accomplish things that they didn't think they could do in the period of the 90s when the U.S. was uh, running supreme. But uh, I think it's really that in, they both latched onto the civilizational gap with the United States and the West as the driving force for widening other aspects of relations. And so particularly the civilizational gap. So uh, if you want to read about um, Chinese arguments about their harmonious tradition, their civilizational um, uh, traditions, which combine Confucianism with some other factors. Uh, there's tension between Confucianism and socialism. So they're not always just highlighting this glory of Confucianism. And when Confucianism was raised, it's not the old Confucianism for which uh, Columbia is well known as a center of analysis, DeBerry's work and other work here, but rather it is the Chinese communist version of Confucianism with a very powerful role for the state and uh, emphasizing the Confucianism as totally consistent with socialist rule. So 180 degree turn from the Maoist critique of, of Confucianism. And in, um, in, in Russia, the effort to build up Russia as a civilization uh, has been very uh, apparent. Um, going to the next dimension, um, I, no, I'll just add one more point. It's not that China and Russia see each other as civilizational compatriots. They don't. And on many of these dimensions, it's not that China and Russia are really together, but particularly on the cultural side, there is a good deal of tension. They don't really see each other as close. There's not a lot of popular you know, sympathy with each other. The Chinese don't really want to study in Russia, uh, and they're often treated with xenophobia when they're over there and fear crime on the streets against Asians. And the Russians, except for making some money, aren't so fascinated with China. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that they talk about each other as a civilizational problem much. They did in the late 90s when there was a demagogic effect in the Russian Far East in particular about the yellow peril and talking about some Chinese themes in very negative ways and the danger of mass migration. And that still filters through in some Russian writings, but it's not the, the mainstream, it's not the leadership's way of thinking about it. And Putin. Uh, a decade ago silenced those who would play up uh, these kinds of themes. When we go to the next dimension, vertical, it really refers to uh, human rights and uh, values and the sense that um, interference in internal affairs, it's the way you organize your society. Are you proud of it or are you not? And, you know, traditionally China was very proud of its Confucian family system and the way, sort of uh, balance between center and locality and many who praise Confucianism think particularly about this combination but um, this is not the, the issue so much it's they each emphasize the preservation of their internal order requiring a strong center and how the center shapes the economy and the culture and minimize the civil society. Civil society is seen as a threat rather than as a way of strengthening the country and they contrast that with with the West. So the United States is, is targeted. The one dimension that can lead to the longest discussion, but I'm going to cut it short, is the horizontal dimension, and that is how they see the outside world. And right away in the mid-90s, China and Russia had agreed on this as a basis for uh, coordinating, working more closely together. So it was against U.S. unipolarity, and then under Bush, U.S. preemption, and um, even stronger type of unipolarity. And then they emphasize multipolarity. And whether it was looking at the global community or at the role of the US as the most important factor in the international environment or at elements of regionalism in Asia, we find uh, the emphasis on the US as the problem and each other, despite some considerable sensitivity on some themes, particularly on the Russian side, as not so problematic. So they've worked out cooperation in the Russian Far East, although Russia is still looking for some balance, perhaps some initiative towards Japan that people are discussing in the last year might uh, materialize with the possibility that Abe will go to Moscow in a few months and Putin talking positively about something happening in Japanese-Russian relations after they've now essentially gone back to the Irkutsk summit agreement of 2001, which was shelved for 12 years. Um, but that's unlikely to change the overall dynamic, some movement between Russia and Japan. Um, in Central Asia, you would think they have a particular problem coordinating, and they do at times have that. But the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, has helped them manage these issues, and they found other ways, particularly through Chinese deference, regarding Russia as the primary power in Central Asia, except for energy projects. China has continued to defer. Um, so I would say, you know, there's a, they have trouble over Vietnam, Russia's selling of arms to Vietnam. They, ha uh, they have some problems over India, uh, but they pale before the criticism each side launches against the United States role, even in East Asia. Now, there is some possibility that Russia could waver on this if China doesn't handle it well, if the United States is uh, clever in trying to reboot the reset, if, um, if Putin um, uh, starts listening to some other advisors who, he doesn't listen to hardly anyone these days, I gather, who would, might push for more balancing, uh, there could be some shift. But right now, I would say we don't see 
the likelihood of that kind of shift. Uh, so basically, on all of the aspects of the horizontal dimension, although not equally so, we've got a closer Sino-Russian partnership over identity issues more than interest issues. And here I see the conflict between identity and interest as really sharp, because if Russia considered its national interest with care, and, and, and there are Russians who, who say this, uh, they would be trying to provide more balance to China. They would be more concerned about this. Well, let me jump ahead now. I've gone through the dimensions and argued why Sino-Russian relations have strengthened uh, and are likely to remain rather strong as long as, particularly as Putin has has this approach that he's been taking. But let me now trace a little bit of this relationship with an emphasis on what's happening right now. So, um, I think the potential in the 80s was much greater for moving away from the national identity approach. It was held up for quite particular reasons. Um, in, in the Soviet Union, I think they made the major mistakes in the first half of the 90s, and it took until the middle of 86 for Gorbachev to oust the people who were demonizing China in ways that made it very difficult to move on relations. China would have been ready to move earlier and to some degree on this relationship. And then Gorbachev came in and the Chinese, while they didn't like his domestic policy very early, that I don't think was the number one sticking point. I think his biggest problem was new thinking. The Chinese regarded him as a traitor to the Soviet Union and to communist bloc, socialist bloc. And if you try to get, come up with one adjective for Gorbachev in China, it is traitor. And he was seen long before he became the rally point for the demonstrators in the spring of 1989 as they were gathering in Tiananmen. And he had to go through the back door for his meeting with Deng Xiaoping. Long before that, he was um, seen very negatively in China, particularly as far as foreign policy with the United States. Um, some of his other foreign policy moves in Europe and elsewhere. But in the 1990s, Yeltsin shifted foreign policy much quicker than most people realize. By the December 1992, his first year in office, he visited Beijing. He had just scathingly attacked Japan and refused the visit, uh, canceled his visit to Japan on short notice. He visited Beijing, and it was a more upbeat visit than many would argue. He, um, I think it started relations on, on a positive way. Already, the military side of relationship was moving forward quite quite well. In 1994, upgrading of relations, 96, significant upgrading. So it isn't just Putin. This was happening in Russia a good deal earlier. I think that Putin was seen in a, as a, a bit of a puzzle for a few years. And then when he came out strongly against the US war in Iraq, while the Chinese were more cautious, not because that was their real thinking, but because they thought that was um, the politi politic thing to do at the time. A number of Chinese, and these aren't the, you know, the young people on the outs, as occurred with the fascination with Gorbachev in 1987, 88, 89. These were people closer to the security establishment. Some would call some of them Maoists and others. They came to appreciate Putin. China was talking about peaceful development, hesitant about even saying peaceful rise, and Putin was standing up to the United States in a serious way. He got a quite a, I think, a good following in China, and that helped smooth the end of the territorial dispute, the final move 
to end the dispute in 2004. I think that with China's shift um, in its thinking towards a great, much greater assertiveness, uh, as seen in its shift in policy towards North Korea in the spring of 2009, I think that raised attention to what could be done with Russia. But they were rather frustrated when Medvedev was emphasizing the reset. Things, uh, China-Russian relations were somewhat on hold, but the Chinese, with their generous loan, although they got very good prices for the oil they were going to get from the pipeline, for which they lent $25 billion, with this money, China solidified relations with Russia at that time. But they really wanted more. I mean, China has pushed for a much stronger relationship with Russia for a while. And in 2011, as soon as Putin announced his plans for um, running for re-election, coinciding with uh, Xi Jinping making plans for what he was going to do as party secretary, the signal from Xi already was he wanted to make Moscow his first stop as the new president after he was formally elected in March. And it only took him two weeks after that election to make his way to Moscow. The Chinese and Russian coverage of that meeting was somewhat different. China was more optimistic and positive. Not that Russia was negative in any way, uh, but really get the theme of a kind of semi-alliance coming out of China, although they previously against alliances, with the hopes of real cooperation on advanced weapons development. They want Russian military technology. They got some good things in the 90s. Russia's been holding back for a while. They've been getting some new things lately, but they want more. And they see this as a way of narrowing the military gap with the United States, getting a hold of Russia's best military technology. Um, Russia remains hesitant, but there is some movement in that direction, given Putin's new way of thinking. So that is one um, uh, theme that emerged in this meeting. Um, another theme was how strong the economic relationship would be. Will China thinking that it's pretty stymied in the East. The Sino-Japanese split is here to stay, and it's big time. There's going to be no rapprochement, I'm confident, between China and Japan. I think they've broken in a big way. And it relates to the national identity gap, and Japan is responding in kind. Abe's uh, identity agenda, in part, is a reflection of of China's, uh, the problem he has with China, although there are other factors, of course, with Abe. Uh, but the, really the issue is, can China sort of solidify Russia as its partner, including with big energy projects, the natural gas pipeline that has still not been concluded, although they were very upbeat and they said they would agree on the price by the end of the year and they would start building the pipeline. Uh, the problems they've still had with oil, although they've announced the doubling of Russian oil exports, some of which come through the existing pipeline, but others will come through the, the new pipeline that Russia's built to the Russian Far East, but that can send oil down uh, by ocean. Um, so can they, will China shift its position They've had a lot of tensions in these energy negotiations over price and other issues. Will China give Russia a better deal for geopolitical reasons? Because they want to solidify this partnership in a new way. Because Russia can be persuaded by money. And Putin's emphasis in his assessment of the March summit was um, the, the economic side. He wants um, the development of the Russian Far East and Siberia. And the Chinese did, four or five years ago or so, agree to a considerable step up in their role. But by and large, trade remains heavily Russian natural resources and energy for Chinese consumer products and now industrial products. 
These terms of trade are not desired by Russia. Russia is upset. China occasionally throws in a bone, uh, building a nuclear reactor in China, things of this sort. Russia wants something more. Will China find a way to satisfy Russia on economic terms, even though it might come at some economic cost, because the Chinese don't really respect the Russian economy and think there's that much to gain except the natural resources. But they can do some things to assuage Russian um, nervousness and, and solidify this relationship. So I think that's really a test of Xi Jinping. Actually, Hu Jintao and Putin, despite the fact the relationship was strengthened, never hit it off very well. The chemistry wasn't very good. Putin, I think, was seen as interfering and saying some strange things and doing some things, so the meetings never went all that well, even though it was all hush-hush and they never said anything negative about each other, and particularly the leaders. But I think Xi Jinping understands that, and he wants, and he and Putin want to establish a different kind of chemistry. We'll see how that goes. Um, again, it's not going to be genuine closeness, but it can be uh, a, a sense of sort of going back to the golden age of, of relations of the 1950s, which Yeltsin tried to do a bit when he would sing the, the, the glorious Soviet wartime and post-war songs that he had learned while he was a student in the, in the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Well, there's still quite a few left from that generation who, uh, who remember these days well. So in other words, I see right now China saying to itself, things in East Asia are troubled. The best they can manage is sort of to stabilize things. And the idea of moving west to strengthen China's diplomacy there is becoming more popular. Wang Ji Si has been writing about this, although his views are not exactly those of the leadership, but nonetheless, uh, there is some interest in things he's saying. But moving west starts in two places, Russia and India. India is a long shot. Everybody's been wooing India, including Russia. We'll see if China can get away from its demonization of India that has occurred off and on in the recent years, despite improved economic ties. And um, we'll see what happens after the Afghan pullout, because that involves questions of cooperation in the West. But really, it's Russia. For the last 20 years, Russian relations have been far more important in China than most people realize. And they haven't been so important because of the economic benefits to China. They've been important because of the national identity and security aspects to the relationship. And China's notion of balance of power and how to uh, deal with other countries, particularly its notion that Japan isn't that important, which has been true for a long time in the mainstream. And so I think really it's Russia that they've got to figure out how to solidify this strong relationship, build on the national identity connection, and that means they've got to be cautious in dealing with some other issues because they could have spillover into Russia. They can't. Um, I would think that they, they should be cautious in how they handle the Japan issue, uh, the Diaoyu Senkaku issue, um, at least not landing troops there, raising, bringing them to a sharp, harsh conclusion, and maybe um, try to somehow manage these war potential issues of Iran, Iran and North Korea in such a way where they can continue to solidify their leadership boost sinocentrism, but give Russia a special place where there's no hint of sinocentrism with regard to Russia, very little of it with regard to Central Asia, and Russia is the partner in moving west that China can, uh, can hope for. I'll close with that. It's not a particularly optimistic ending. I think we should expect continued strong Sino-Russian relations for some time in the future, driven by national identities more than by national interest, particularly for Russia. Um, and this poses problems for U.S. management of relations with both countries. Uh, but I don't really see the U.S. so much as the driving force in Asia for recent years. I think it is China. I think China right now is the driving force. It remains so. Obama's foreign policy I see is largely reactive.
not um, pushing things very hard, although it is interpreted as the country that is forcing China and Russia together in both of those countries. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Gil. I'll be as brief as possible to maximize the uh, time for Q&A. Thank you for your very wide-ranging and in insightful remarks on Sino-Russian relations. I suppose in, in the interest of full disclosure, I should confess that Gil Rossman got me my first job, uh, inviting me to Princeton on a one-year visiting assistant professorship just out of my PhD where I taught Korean studies courses and also was involved with him and Steve Kotkin on a Northeast Asia project which became this book, Korea at the Center, which Gil mentioned. Uh, Gil, as you've heard, uh, brings two things together that are rarely seen uh, in today's scholarship, particularly a depth of local and comparative knowledge of a specific region uh, and a, uh, an insightful, even elegant framework of analysis. He's able to look at Northeast Asia from every angle, the Chinese, Russian, Japanese, Korean. He takes history seriously, which as a historian I always admire in a social scientist. Uh, and he does his research in all the relevant language, languages, which is indeed admirable. In a, in a time when area knowledge matters, it seems more than ever, it's remarkable how little support it gets uh, in the academy uh, and in the society at large. And I think we've uh, heard tonight how important it is to really try to get behind the superficial punditocracies and the headlines to understand what's going on in these far-flung areas of the world that means so much ultimately to us. Um, I, I think uh, one remark that Gil made I found really striking, uh, this reference to a communist great power national identity syndrome, which I, I'd like him to, to talk about more if he can, uh, and its value for shaping identity in China and Russia. I think one thing we're finally learning now in, in the um, second decade of the 21st century is that history didn't end with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and communism didn't even end with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, or a simple, one simple fact is that there were 10 countries run by Marxist-Leninist parties in 1989, and now there are five. Uh, sorry, there are 15, and now there are five. So 10 collapsed but five continue. But even those like Russia, they are not run officially by a Marxist-Leninist party, still have very important legacies of the communist period. I want to just throw out um, for the general discussion or for, for Gil to respond to if he wishes three questions that come to me arising out of his talk. Uh, we hear uh, from him that both uh, Russia, Chinese and Russian national identities uh, have formed a kind of uh, coming together in a way, and yet it could be argued that in both cases, particularly in the Russian case, national identity is very much still in the process of formation or rethinking. It's often said that uh, Russia is dealing with a post-imperial identity for the first time after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I wonder what that means for Russia-Chinese relations, and also not least what that means for the vast spaces in between. What does, uh, what's the future of Central Asia in this Russo-Chinese relationship? Is it a space of cooperation, competition, or something else? Second, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, this uh, relationship uh, in it, the respective countries' relations with their regions. Uh, we heard a little bit about China and Japan. Japan has now become the other in the region against which China's national identity identifies itself, not Russia. Russia also has an ambivalent relationship to Europe. And yet, Russia, I would I would say, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, has become a much more Eurocentric or European-focused country than the Soviet Union was, and that perhaps has to uh, has some bearing on the fact that China seems to value this relationship more, the, the Sino-Russian relationship more, than Russia uh, values its relationship with China. But also, uh, their relations with the world at large, not just the U.S., are uh, taking a very interesting form. Uh, with other uh, countries um, in their regions and beyond, and not least with, the, uh, with their role on the UN Security Council, in which there seems to be quite a bit of agreement on how to deal with countries like Syria, Iran, and North Korea, uh, which is sharply different from the view of the United States uh, and America's allies in Europe and elsewhere. 
So there does seem to be a common interest in approaches to the world, but a, 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 an imbalance perhaps on how they th see each other. And finally, um, I would like to ask, what is the potential for a deepening institutional relationship between the two countries, and in particular in larger forums in which they're both involved? Um, Gil mentioned briefly the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, SCO. There's also BRICS, which, uh, which just had a summit involving Brazil and India, as well as Russia and China. Uh, these organizations are often dismissed, not taken very seriously in the United States. I wonder if, if you have any thoughts, Gil, on if, if there is a potential for a deepening bilateral and multilateral uh, sets of institutional relations in which China and Russia become embedded. And is there a potential uh, for a kind of Sino-Russian balance through these forums against the United States, uh, if indeed that is their goal? So I will stop my remarks here. Thank you. A lot of good issues are on the table, so let me go through them one by one and give you some thoughts I have, although um, there are many things that still remain uncertain. Uh, <clears throat> the communist great power national identity syndrome can be seen by trying to compare what causes it, going back and saying what historically shaped identity in both countries. How much was there a parallel experience as each country became a kind of messianic force for transforming the world and against each other in their rivalry in the 60s and 70s, but with the potential once ideology was rather weakened as the, as the dominant identity for us to change. So I think that uh, uh, that kind of comparison uh, can be carried a good deal further. And uh, I would particularly say that we've been misleading ourselves in what we've seen in Russia, as if Russia made this great break away from communism at the end of the Gorbachev period and in the early <coughs> Yeltsin period, and we use a kind of dichotomy between communism or, or as mainly political force, an ideological force, and um, democracy. And but when we get more into more detail about what a national identity consists of, I think we come up with more of a sense that really Russia has been wending its way back to where China, close to where China is in a lot of respects. Uh, beginning in the 90s with the sort of admiration many had for China. And indeed, many of the Soviet specialists who had been so critical of China in the Sino-Soviet uh, split turned out to be the most enthusiastic supporters of China by the middle of the 1990s. Uh, at any rate, that is that. Now I would say, is there a parallel in any other country? Well, I can't imagine that Laos or Cuba would matter for this, but North Korea might retain some elements of this kind of identity syndrome. Uh, that would be the case that would seem to me most likely to be a parallel, and I'm sure Charles would be able to assess that so much better than I could. Uh, I would just add on that point that I've been hearing Chinese refer to Russia as if it is re becoming more like the Soviet Union. And they're happy about it. They really wish the Soviet Union hadn't collapsed. Much of that's something we read. They wanted more balance between the United States and the Soviet Union for China's own rise. They don't highlight what they gained from that Soviet collapse, and that was considerable, but rather they highlight what they gained by the strengthening of Russia, and they play this up with the Russians a lot. Uh, so that in a sense that um, they both regret 
both sides regret the Sino-Soviet split and its consequences. Uh, another shared element in their history. Now, I do agree that there is some flux in Russian national identity. Uh, I think there's flux in Chinese national identity, too, and I, I, I'm aware of groups in China that have been fighting elements of this identity um, uh, syndrome that I've been discussing. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think, though, that these groups have a nearly the clout we anticipated. So the shift in China in 2009 on, it seems to have awakened the, the left more than the right. The reform forces have been rather quickly marginalized and weakened, even if they could <coughs> gain further strength from the rise of the middle class and the potential economic uh, crisis that could come in China uh, if it parallels what we've seen in, in other countries. So I don't believe that the Chinese national identity is fixed, but I think it's certainly solidified in recent years, and it's going to be hard to challenge that, uh, particularly the forces in the Internet and the forces in the um, um, those who wield the most power in, in the uh, local and national elites, the military security establishment, are likely to press that identity from the left rather than the right. Um, but in Russia, there is potential for more flux. Uh, but we've seen how relatively easily Putin consolidated power. We, the, the reformers who were thought to be significant in the early 90s faded so quickly uh, had so little political support. And the challenge to what Putin has done in the last year and a half has been so weak. I mean, some demonstrations, some protests, but really no ability to articulate a different national identity agenda. And Medvedev was really not serious in, 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 in presenting that agenda. He's much more supportive of Putin. So I think in Central Asia, um, there is considerable potential for trouble. So there are a lot of triangles in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Japan, uh, and beyond, where Sino-Russian national interests don't coincide, and where we could see more tensions. But given the overall identity uh, approach, I would say China and Russia will figure out how to, um, to put those rather aside. Um, China won't insist that Russia not sell weapons to Vietnam. It, no, it will not insist that Russia support China's uh, territorial dispute with Japan. Um, for a while, Russia seemed to be re supporting it, and then it stopped doing so. Uh, I don't think China needs to press Russia so hard, uh, drive Russia into a corner. Uh, because there is the danger of a backlash there. So a lot depends on how China handles it. Of course, a number of Chinese have been rather arrogant in their personal contacts with Russians. Um, and that, uh, similar to maybe to the way the Rus Soviets were arrogant to China in the um, 50s and 60s. Um, with regard to regions, I think there was initial agreement was between Chechnya and China would support Russia and Chechnya, no matter what it did. No human rights issues mattered. That was important for Yeltsin in the 90s. And Russia would support China and Taiwan um, after some initial hesitation in the early 90s. I think there's still some tensions over Ukraine. China's made considerable inroads in the western part of the former Soviet Union. Um, but I don't agree that Russia's more Eurocentric than it used to be. I think that, yes, Russia lost uh, some of its military clout and ability to assist some of the countries in Asia when it was running this uh, foolhardy foreign policy of overextending itself um, in, uh, in its military buildup in the Russian Far East and Afghanistan and supporting Vietnam and Cambodia and so on. But if you say, do the Russians consider themselves Eurasian, an eagle facing two ways. That has been their overall rhetorical theme since the mid-90s. Yeltsin firmly supported that. They saw themselves, with, starting with North Korea, uh, 
as the country that helped them make a comeback uh, by 2001 as significantly strengthening their position in, in East Asia. And now with their energy moving more and more to the Pacific rather than to uh, Europe, I think this is part of their redefinition. So in terms of identity terms, they have been moving away from the West quite significantly. And I think in terms of security and in terms of uh, um, uh, trade, that's also happening. But they do want to regain their leverage in the former Soviet Union. Uh, they're pushing hard on Georgia and Ukraine uh, with efforts to, to strengthen themselves. Uh, but uh, Charles was right, I think, to emphasize um, the um, Syria, Iran, North Korea kind of agreement in the Security Council. They must, Russia and China, sort of have an agreement. They have to cooperate with each other. And on Syria, this was Russia's stance, and China said, okay, we're going to back you on Syria. What's the quid pro quo? And so some suggested that the Chinese were saying to Russia, now back us with, on our territorial dispute with Japan. Well, Russia hasn't quite done that, so maybe they're, they don't always agree on what's the quid pro quo, but basically they're still operating in that way. In terms of who values the relationship more, I don't know. It's changed over time. One so country has pushed for a stronger relationship at times when the other country wasn't pushing for it. At any rate, I'll, I'll finally stop. I, the last point, the deepening institutional relationship, and here I will argue that um, um, they've got to have another partner if it's going to be multilateral. And India is the prime country, but India is very unlikely to swing behind the two. So I don't think much likelihood of multilateralism ahead. I think this is mainly a, a bilateral relationship. Okay, very good. Please come up to the microphone for your questions. Uh, I have a question, I guess, both for Professor Osmond and for Charles, if um, Professor Armstrong, if you can be helpful in it. Uh, with the Chowin and with Yang Piang, both Russia, China, and the Security Council played a helpful role in actually inviting North Korea into the Security Council and hearing them. And so uh, that was, in what I've seen of the Security Council, an unusual situation. But in the situation of what's happened recently with the satellite going up and then the, uh, nuclear, uh, the nuclear test, both Russia and China somehow went along with the US. And I'm wondering if there's any insight about why and what's happened. Prior, I thought with the satellite, China had stood up a bit in the Security Council and had not allowed a resolution to be um, issued. Instead, they put sanctions on a presidential statement, which was very unusual, but was done. So I wondered if there's any insight of how we somehow got into the situation that's so hostile when there is this rare example of uh, the Security Council being made to invite in North Korea and to hear from them. That's very rare, but it has happened twice in the recent past, in 2010. Gil, I don't think I... I think we both could answer this at great length, and uh, I will simply say that um, uh, China and Russia mainly agreed on the Chonan issue, not to take it before the Security Council, and the Yongpyeong issue, Russia was much harsher on North Korea than China. Um, but on the um, uh, recent issues, I think China has been, wants to control the way the North Korean relationship unfolds. And therefore, when they agree to, they, they water down the sanctions. They manage the sanctions. And then they enforce them in their own way. And we have no way of being confident sometimes how they're enforcing some of these things. And I think the general assessment is they haven't enforced some of the Security Council sanctions. But they, uh, but they, want, they don't want North Korea to do something that would be uh, really destabilizing. But I, what I've heard, and, and I'll, I'll, we may, you may hear other opinions on this, is that 
denuclearization is a low priority for China, a somewhat higher priority for Russia. The, weak, the North Korean economic and security dependence on China in order to reshape the security balance in the region, put pressure on the U.S., weaken South Korea's position with regard to North Korea, is a priority for China. So the usual explanations given for why China doesn't pressure North Korea very hard, I don't generally ex agree to. And I would even say it's possible right now, I can't be confident of it, that there's already a Chinese-North Korean understanding. North Korea has already said to China, we're going to go this far in this crisis and we won't go beyond this red line. And China said, you have to understand, here's our red line. Uh, but basically, China is likely to keep supporting North Korea, I would argue, in these circumstances, as long as North Korea doesn't create a, a war atmosphere. <clears throat> Um, you say it's national identity trumps national interests. Which country do you see changing that dynamic first? Hmm. For me, with the investments that China is doing in Africa, it seems that Africa would do that sooner, but you've got the North Korean issue that might slow it up. And if one country starts to act in its national interests more than national identity, how do you see Well, I, I, was, and I was speaking specifically in this bilateral relations, Sino-Russian relations, identity has repeatedly trumped national interests and I think it's doing so again today. Now in terms of dealing with Africa, um, there are identity elements, but I think there's a very strong national interest element in China's policies towards Africa. So I wouldn't, that's not a dyad I was focusing on in my analysis. But if you say which country is likely to change things first, I think in Russia, um, as Charles Rutley brought out, uh, there's still more flux in identity and the interest uh, lead against China more fully than the Chinese interests lead against Russia. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to uh, hone in on is the um, divide between China and Japan. How will that affect the uh, Sino-American relations in terms of putting an upper limit on what's possible? And also, could you expand your analysis to include Iran, where you have the U.S., China, and Russia seeming to cooperate? But how would national identity be negotiated for mm. that? I'm much more comfortable talking about Japan than Iran. Um, so I, uh, um, I, I, won't, I really won't want to talk about Iran. It's, it, it's beyond my, my realm of, of, of specialization. But Japan, I paid a lot of attention to. Um, and here, I, I think that Japan, the Japan-China-US triangle is rather interesting. And I, I think what Obama tried to do in the Abe visit was to tell Abe that he wants to emphasize proved ties with China this year. He doesn't want Japan to get into the way, in the way. The US will support Japan on the territorial dispute, as it has done before, although not uh, agree that this territory belongs to Japan, merely that the U.S. alliance applies to territories administered by Japan, and that um, the worry in the U.S. is not only that China will drive this cause of crisis there, maybe one unintended because of the proximity of, of ships and planes, but also that Abe, if he followed through on the platform of his party, last fall would cause the issue to become much more serious. So basically the U.S. position is to emphasize North Korea this year and Iran to try to work again with China. I think the six party talks have always been about Sino-U.S. relations more than anything else. And to um, urge Abe to 
have a cautious foreign policy and strengthen U.S.-Japanese defense ties as a way of dealing with the issues in the region. Uh, uh, thanks for the lecture. Um, first of all, you spoke not just communism, but I think communism appropriated, as early as the Stalin period, the Russian traditional thinking and twisted it, and then that is what's happened in the 90s and on in China in appropriating and then twisting it. So it's all about anti-West in history, and that leaves out a good deal of the history, as you well know, of both countries. Now, on economic national identity, there's been a huge shift from traditional communism, and therefore, <coughs> both sides claim that they found a way to achieve in economic integration with the world. Not all talking, but integration. And, but they would never use the word capitalist. So they claim that they've achieved an economic national identity. And we might say they've done something that we regard as capitalist. But they're trying to present that identity as if it contrasts to what goes on, the laissez-faire, low state involvement type of capitalism. Uh, as far as low taxes, yeah, that, but they, don't, they, they may have them, but not, not with any claim that that is a sign that the state power is, is diminished. 
Um, and I agree that if you start analyzing identity in a more complex way as a narrative from below, and particularly with Russia where you've got elements of the civil society, opposition groups expressing that identity, and last year they were able to express it rather strongly, and in Moscow perhaps the majority of people hold those critical views of uh, what Putin's trying to do. It matters. But I, I don't have the optimism that that is a way of changing the country or that they can express their views in a way to present things coherently and reach the population widely. And that's why I, I don't believe the challenge to Putin is, appears to be all that, that great. Uh, as far as Taiwan's example, um, that's what we were, a lot of people were saying 20 years ago. Taiwan would be the model for China. It was going to show the way for how you can draw on Chinese tradition and globalize and establish a new identity. Well, Taiwan has moved away from that in a way by saying, oh, we have a Taiwanese identity. They don't want to be so emphasis and give so much emphasis to the Chinese identity because that provides a rationale for uh, reintegration on the terms that the mainland has advocated. Um, so, and I think the in the PRC, they've done a lot to try to isolate that notion of Taiwan as a, an identity center. So, um, and the Confucianism they've interpreted is not the Confucianism that was seen as the pride of Taiwan. Uh, so those are my responses there. And finally, the question about Central Asia. Um, I do think a lot can be said about the Sino-Russian strains in dealing with Central Asia. Um, and uh, they, they've envisioned the SCO in very different ways. China wants it to be much more an economic free trade agreement. Russia has nixed that idea, nothing like that. China would gain too much, they think. Uh, meanwhile, there are Central Asian countries that want to play off the two countries, since China and Russia, so they have something quite different in mind. Russia wants a security framework that isolates, that keeps China out. So the SEO is neither a security framework nor uh, an economic regionalism, and even culturally, um, there's a very complicated mix there. So it's some kind of strange mixture, but yet it, it doesn't seem to be weakening. They, they seem to see, hey, we've got value in this, let's keep it going. So I think you've got a good topic there to keep working on. Jay, I'm sorry, we're going to have a You can chat after the session. All right, well, again, I want to uh, uh, thank our speaker. Uh, and, uh,